Hello dear listener please subscribe to our channel enjoy watching. Ever have one of those nights when you're the life of the party, the center of attention, and you think, yeah, this is it, I've made it? That's how I felt that night. The place was buzzing, music thrumming through the walls of that rooftop bar, the kind where you have to be somebody or know somebody to get in. And for once, I felt like I was somebody. Or at least, I was pretending to be. We'd been living in New York for about a year by then. Me and Amanda, my wife, or at least she was still my wife back then, moved here when she landed some hotshot job in advertising. You know the type, big office, view of the skyline, and a paycheck that made my bank account look like a joke. I was working from home, freelancing in web design, scraping together enough to pay for dinner out once in a while. She was the breadwinner, no doubt about it. And that's fine, or at least, I told myself it was fine. The party was hers, a celebration for landing some massive client. I didn't know the details, and frankly, I didn't care. I was there for the free booze and the chance to be close to her for once. We hadn't been close in a while. Not since we moved, not since she started working late hours and going on business trips more often than not. So, I'm there, hanging on the edge of the crowd, watching her glide through the room like she owns it. Which, in a way, she does. She's got that glow about her, the kind that used to be for me. But now, it's for everyone else. I watched as she laughed with her colleagues, throwing her head back in that way that shows off her perfect teeth and perfect life. She was good at this, at being someone who matters. And me? I was the guy at the edge, clutching my whiskey like a life raft. Then, I saw him. Tall, dark, and annoyingly handsome. The kind of guy who looks like he should be in a cologne ad. He walked right up to her, put his hand on her back in that too familiar way and whispered something in her ear. She laughed, but not the polite kind. It was the laugh she used to give me, the one that says, You get me. You're the only one who gets me. And right then, something inside me snapped. I don't remember much of the rest of that night. Just flashes, really. Her smiling at him, them standing too close, the way he looked at her like he owned her. The way she didn't seem to mind. And then me, sitting in the cab on the way home, gripping the seat like it was the only thing keeping me from flying apart. When we got home, I didn't say anything. Just went to bed and stared at the ceiling. She didn't come to bed until hours later, and when she did, I pretended to be asleep. I couldn't face her, not after what I'd seen. Not after what I knew, deep down, had been happening for months. Maybe even a year. Hell, maybe even before we moved to the city. The next day, I did something I hadn't done in a long time. I took a day off. Didn't even turn on my computer. I needed to think. Needed to figure out what the hell I was going to do. Because one thing was clear, this wasn't something I could just ignore. Not anymore. I decided to do some digging. I mean, it's the age of technology, right? If there was anything to find, I'd find it. And I did. It didn't take long. A couple of emails left open on her laptop, some late-night texts that she didn't bother to delete. The name came up over and over again. Marco. What a name. Sounds like a villain in a soap opera. It wasn't hard to put the pieces together. The business trips that always seemed to coincide with his, the late nights at the office when he was also working late, the sudden, unexplained expenses on our credit card. It all added up to one thing, my wife was having an affair. And not just any affair. This was a full-blown, behind-my-back, in-my-face kind of betrayal. But here's the thing. I didn't confront her. I didn't scream, shout, or cry. I didn't throw her things out the window like in the movies. No, I did something much better. I plotted. Over the next few weeks, I watched. I waited. I learned. I needed to know everything before I made my move. And believe me, when I finally did, it was worth every second of preparation. You see, Amanda and I had joint accounts, joint assets, joint everything. She'd made me an equal partner in her financial life, 
trusting me with the management of our money because, frankly, she couldn't be bothered with the details. That was her mistake. Well, that and cheating on me with Marco. So, I started moving things around. Slowly, carefully. I set up new accounts in my name only, transferred funds bit by bit so it wouldn't raise any alarms. I took out a second mortgage on our apartment, using my half of the equity. I sold some stocks, liquidated a few investments. All perfectly legal, all within my rights as her husband. All without her knowing a damn thing. Next, I did some research on Marco. Turns out, he wasn't as clean cut as he seemed. He had a history, and not a pretty one. A few fraud charges from his college days, a bankruptcy that got quietly settled. Nothing that had ever landed him in jail, but enough to know he wasn't the upstanding guy he pretended to be. So, I did what any loving husband would do, I set him up. Created a few fake accounts, opened some credit cards in his name, and ran up the charges. I had a little help from a friend in IT who owed me a favor. Marco's online footprint suddenly looked a lot shadier than it had before. Then, the piece de resistance, a little insider trading scheme. Amanda's company had just landed a big contract, and she'd blabbed about it to me, thinking I was too stupid or too uninterested to do anything with the information. But I wasn't. I bought some stocks in her name, in Marco's name, just before the announcement went public. When the stock soared, it looked like they'd both made a tidy little profit from insider knowledge. Illegal? You bet. Traceable? Only if you were looking for it, and now someone was. The final act was the hardest part. I had to act normal, had to pretend everything was fine while my plan set itself in motion. I played the doting husband, kept up appearances, and waited for the right moment to pull the trigger. It came on a Saturday. We were supposed to have dinner with friends, one of those couples things that Amanda liked to do to show off how perfect our life was. But that afternoon, the SEC came knocking. And the police. They had warrants. They had questions. And they had handcuffs. I watched as they led Amanda out of our apartment in cuffs, her eyes wide with shock, her mouth hanging open in disbelief. They took her phone, her computer, everything. She was under investigation for fraud, insider trading, and conspiracy to commit wire fraud. And her lover? Well, Marco was already in the back of another squad car, looking just as stunned as she was. I stayed calm, cool, collected. I was the picture of the shocked, grieving husband, blindsided by the betrayal of the woman I loved. I gave my statement to the authorities, cooperated fully, handed over every email, every text, every bank statement they asked for. And when it was all over, I walked back into our apartment, now just my apartment, and poured myself a drink. Amanda and Marco went to trial. It was a media circus. Two high-flying executives caught in a web of deceit and lies. They both pleaded not guilty, of course, but the evidence was damning. The paper trail was perfect, too perfect to be anything but true. They went down hard, and I watched it all from the front row. In the end, Amanda got 10 years, Marco got 15. I didn't visit, didn't write, didn't send a single message. I just disappeared from their lives like they'd disappeared from mine. Took the money I'd moved, sold the apartment, and started over. Some were warm, some were quiet, some were I could forget the life I'd left behind. And you know what? I don't regret a damn thing. Because sometimes, revenge isn't about getting even. It's about getting ahead. And me? I'm miles ahead, living my best life while they rot behind bars. So yeah, maybe it wasn't the most moral thing I've ever done. But it was the right thing for me. And if I had to do it all over again? I'd do it in a heartbeat. Because in the end, you have to look out for yourself. No one else will. And sometimes, the best revenge isn't just getting back at someone. It's living well without them. If you leave a comment, tell us what you think about the story you heard. It's important to us and will help us find and tell stories that you find interesting. Thank you for watching us.